Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Easter edition of COVID-19 Church. Now, I have serious, hey, this is North Jack's Church of God. I'm Pastor Jim once more. We are welcoming you into our broadcast. What do you say we have some music by Ray and Mel now? Happy Easter, everyone. It seems strange, us not all gathering together on this Easter Sunday. So here we are again at Ray and Melody Barber's house. We hope some of the songs that we're singing today will bring back some Easter memories for you. Right there at your home, if you would join us and sing those familiar phrases and worship the Lord with us as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoy. that is 
father had forsaken him, turned his back on his son, despising our sin. All hell seemed to whisper, just forget him, he's dead. Then the father looked down. Where is your sting? Who has been defeated? 
Easter sermon. I told you that over the last few weeks, we have been sending out a little study sheet on the book of Job. So we've been here in this fun little book here, the book of Job. And this morning, I sent out chapter 14. In chapter 14, I want to go a little bit farther on this now. This is Job speaking. And if I can read this to you, follow along, starting at verse number one. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So get this as Job starts pouring out his heart here. He says that mortal man is of a few days and full of trouble. Let's get the first of those there, of a few days goes in verse two and says this, he comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. The scriptures tell us that there are five different things that man's life is, is compared to. He says that our life is like grass that is mowed down and withers by the end of the day. Our life is like a flower that fades. It's like a shadow that is fleeting it is like a vapor that is here and then is gone. And then the interesting one, it says that our life is like a hand breath. What in the world is a hand breath? If you hold up your hand and the distance going across from your thumb all the way to your little finger, that's called the hand breath. Did you know that your life is only that short? That short. If you want to get a main point right now, here it is. Life is short. How short? Well, if you took a trip to the beach 
You were down there at the seashore and you took one little dropper, went out into the water and sucked up some water into it and then held that dropper and squeezed out one little droplet, one little droplet. That one little droplet is comparable to your life in that vast ocean that's there in front of you. <laughs> well, let's go a little bit farther here. Whether you are nine or whether you die at 90, honestly, it is a short, short existence. The, first, sec the second thing he says is man is of a few days and he's full of trouble, full of trouble. Have you noticed that trouble seems to find us? No matter where we go in life, no matter what we do, trouble finds us. And if trouble does not find us, Due to our own devices, we mess up and we find ourselves getting into trouble. That's right, our lives. Looking back over our lives, you notice that our lives get nasty with sin. Isn't it amazing how many times we will lie to save our own skin? We will cheat people. We will steal. We will hurt others. We'll have a heart of racism or prejudice or whatever. I'm just saying we do an awful lot to save our own skin, and it's a dilemma a dilemma called sin, and it came as a result of the fall in the garden. Adam and Eve there, given in to the wiles of the devil, and from there, every other malady that has happened in life, it, it came as a result of that stinking old sin that happened there in the garden. I find in verse 4, still there in Job chapter 14, Job gives this thought. He says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, uh, something that is dirty and nasty, grungy and filthy. Who can bring something clean out of that? Job gives an answer. He says, no one, not one, not one. But see, you got to understand that Job is living 2,000 years before Jesus is even born. So with that said, he doesn't know anything about Jesus coming and cleansing the life. Let's go a little bit farther. In verse number five, he said, seeing that a man's days are determined, the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. He cannot pass. And he goes to verse seven, think this now. He says, for there is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again. In verse number nine, he says, yea, through the scent of water, it's going to bud and it will bring forth boughs like a plant. Now, in the backyard of the parsonage where I live, we had a tree that got messed up in a storm and a piece of it fell down, a good piece. So it looked like we realized, hey, the whole tree looked like it was dead. So we had a guy come along, take that thing on down all the way down and left just a little stump out of the ground. I find it amazing in a little over a year, that thing is starting to green and starting to grow again. But here was Job making the statement here that there is such thing called the hope of a tree, that if you cut the tree down, that tree is going to blossom and come forth again. But then in verse 10, he says this, but man, man dieth and he wastes away and he gives up the ghost. And then where is he? So Job despaired. A tree has the hope of coming back, but a man, once he passes from this life, it's not coming back. And so he's filled with all this despair and discouragement, depression, all the D words that we don't like. But there is hope because look what happens in verse number 14. And this is our big teachable moment of the day. It says this, if a man die, shall he live again? Man, this is it. This, this verse right here is monumental. Resurrection fills this verse. If a man die, shall he live again? Yes, there is hope. We have better hope than a tree. We have the hope that is Jesus. And resurrection is bound up in him. See, it was Christ that left the throne of heaven and came to this earth with that in mind. When we look in the scriptures, we look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see his ministry, we get enthralled by it. We love how he does the miracles. We love how he does all this wonderful teaching that can't be refuted. We, we love all the things of him triumphing over the devil and casting out demons and so forth. And man, all that's great, but that is just extra. That, that's like the whipped cream and cherry on top of the sundae. Uh, what Jesus came to do 
is to die on the cross for our sins. What he came to do was pay the penalty for our sin and then rise from the dead. I've told our folks different times in the three-year ministry of Jesus, there comes a point in his ministry that is the turning point. And the turning point happens at Caesarea Philippi. It's there that Christ is with the disciples. I, I've been there, been there on a trip to Israel. And you're there and there's this cliff and there's this big old giant cave. And right there is the cave that's called the gates of hell. And that's where they used to sacrifice babies and so forth years before Jesus got there. But now here is Jesus in his ministry. He's there with the disciples and he's standing in front of this cave called the gates of hell. And he looks around at the disciples that day and he makes this, this statement. He asks a question, who do men say that I am? And one by one, the disciples start looking at each other. Well, some people say that you're Elijah and some people say that you're Jeremiah. Some maybe John the Baptist come back from the dead. Uh, uh, and they gave all, a lot of different answers and Jesus stopped and he said, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And it's at that point that Peter, through all the times that he makes stupid statements, through all the times that he's spontaneous and impetuous, through all the times, here's one time he really gets it right. And at that point, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He knew that he was the Messiah. And it's at that point, that turning point in ministry that Christ Christ sets his sights on Jerusalem. And it's along the next few months as he makes his way south down to Jerusalem, four different times he makes the statement, they're gonna crucify me, they're gonna put me to death, but I will rise again, I will rise again. So it happened. We are celebrating Easter Sunday, that moment when Christ came forth victorious from the tomb, uh, victor over death and hell the grave victor. He said that if, if I live, you're going to live also. He said that he was the resurrection and the life. If any man put their trust and believe in him, uh, though he were dead, yet shall he also live. I'm telling you that we have the blessed hope of Christ. It's the resurrection. Because Christ is alive, we have that same hope. Job goes on in verse 14. He says, if a man die, shall he live again? Well, the answer is yes. But he goes on and he says, all the days of my appointed time. So he knew that he had only so many days upon this planet. And all the days of it, he says, will I wait till my change come? Now, there's the magic words that we wanted to seize upon right there. Do you realize that there's coming a day that those in Christ gets a brand new resurrection body that's just like his? Uh, he had a, a, a wonderful resurrection body that will never be sick, and never have illness or disease, will never die. Uh, man, that's the kind of body that we get to have. He has promised that in his word over and over again. He makes the promise that we can have a resurrection body, one that will gloriously live forever with him in heaven. See, as much as I like this body that I'm in, and I work real hard, I run seven miles in the morning, try to keep in shape, but I tell you what, I'm getting older and older, my hair getting grayer, getting more wrinkles. As much as I like this body, the Lord says we're going to trade it in for a brand new one because this one is not meant to last forever in heaven. But that new one will, which leads us to the question of the hour. If you want to go to heaven, if you want that resurrection body, well, you have to ask forgiveness for your sins. All those things that you're ashamed of in life, all those things that you're guilty of, broken commandments, you can come to Christ and you could say, Lord, please forgive me. Forgive me. I, I'm wrong. I want my life to be different. I open the doors of my heart to you now and I invite you in. Will you come in and be my Lord and Savior and save me? Cover me with your precious blood because that's what it takes to get me to heaven. 
You know, I got to tell you, I did a sermon not too many years ago on all the different burial places, folks like Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius. You know, each one of those, you can go to their tomb. You can go to the place where they're dead and they're buried. But, you know, you can't find that place where Christ is buried because he's alive. He is alive. Uh, will you join me in a closing prayer right now? Lord, for those that are watching right now and they've never said yes to you, I'm asking that you would get to that point with them, that they would open up their heart to you and that they would say, Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean with your precious blood. And from this point on, come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. And from this day on, I will serve you all the way through eternity. Lord, I want you to be my savior. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. God bless y'all.